Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Gene Yu, and I'm honored here to be speaking to you this afternoon. I'm going to tell you guys a story today. Uh, about a year and a half ago, in November 2013, a lady named Evelyn Chang had just finished up about 20 years of working in a factory near Shanghai. And she took a vacation to celebrate her retirement with her husband down in uh, Malaysian Borneo, an island called Pom Pom. And the first night they were there, at about 1 a.m., eight Abu Sayyaf gunmen came across in long boats, climbed into her stilt resort room, grabbed her first out of the bed, breaking her arm, pulling her out of the bed, moved in and then shot her husband eight times, killing him. From there, they put her into the long boat and speared her back into the southern Philippines in a lawless war zone area called the Sulu Archipelago. From there, she was sold from subgroup to subgroup, eventually ending up in an island called Holo into a, uh, a guerrilla camp in the jungle there. Right around that time, uh, I happened to be on gardening leave uh, from Palantir Technologies. I was moving on to my next tech startup. And my mother called me. I was actually here in Hong Kong and told me about this story. And there's not much, not much to it other than that. And it was interesting to me. And I think the reason why she told me at the time was because I actually had done two tours, not as a US Marine Special Forces, it's a US Army Special Forces, a Green Beret. Um, and I had done two tours down in the southern Philippines and was quite well acquainted with this group, Abu Sayyaf. Anything much of it at the time. Um, at, a few days later, I actually traveled to Taipei and I was promoting the, uh, the Chinese language version of uh, my semi-fictional humorous books, just about time in my military, my military experience, called uh, Yellow Green Beret. Uh, they're actually bestsellers now here in Taiwan. Yeah, it's a joke. My sister came up with it, Yellow Green Beret. So uh, under the pen name caricature, uh, Chester Wong. So anyway, so I was doing a lot of uh, uh, media talks at the time uh, in Taipei. And of course, this came up because this was a huge story in Taiwan. Uh, nothing had happened like this before to a Taiwan national. Everybody was shocked. There's, a, there's this feeling in Taiwan all the time that the government is powerless to do anything. So that night, uh, I went home uh, to see my mom. And we talked about the story. And she actually told me that her best friend in high school, uh, Angela Chang, was the older sister of Evelyn Chang. And she had flown back from Florida to try to handle the situation. And they were looking for any type of help. So I happened to be in Taipei at the time, so I said, sure, why don't we have breakfast and I'll at least just listen to the story and then see if I can give some advice. So we met in the morning and the entire Chang fan came out, okay, 10, 10 people. And we met for breakfast and I saw the desperation in their faces and realizing that they had no recourse or anybody could help them. Uh, Taiwan is not a, uh, a, a recognized country. There's no official diplomatic relations between Taiwan and the Philippines. If, uh, if anybody's been in the Philippines and understands the security apparatus there, both the police and military are rife with corruption. There was nobody really helping them out. Um, and I looked at their situation and realized that out of all the options that they had, all the shitty options that they had, I was the best one out of that. And when I looked at it and I said, well, okay, I've been out of the military for, at that time, five years. All my contacts and relationships are dead in the Philippines. When I say dead, sorry, I don't mean they're deceased. I mean, I don't, they're not active. So, um, apologies. <laughs> now, so I made some phone calls uh, actually uh, back to my personal network in special operations and started looking for mercenaries or private security contractors to help. I made a few phone calls. Uh, they were all based in the Philippines. And at that point, I looked at myself and I said, okay, I'm on gardening leave right now. I got the time. And the only thing I had in my schedule was uh, my friends actually here in Hong Kong and organized this trip to Nepal to climb to the base camp of Mount Everest. And they were sitting right there. <laughs> and that was the only thing I had in my, uh, my agenda at the time. And I looked at myself in the mirror and I knew that if I walked away from this, knowing that I could have helped in some way, that I would regret it for the rest of my life. Looking at their faces at that breakfast and knowing that nobody could help them, but just even a little bit that I could help, then I should get involved. So I got on a plane and I went to Manila. Uh, over about a 30-day uh, period, uh, I recruited, at, I recruited a, uh, a mercenary named, private security contractor named John Olofsson. We worked together for about a week and discovered exactly which subgroup she had been uh, sold to and uh, all the intelligence around her exact location. But at that time, you can imagine, this is all one of the shocking things for me in terms of learning and approaching this problem set when it was ongoing was that I never realized in my time in the US military, everywhere I went, whether it was Iraq, Philippines, uh, missions all around Middle East and Southeast Asia, there was always this ready-made, amazing logistical machine of the US military, as well as colleagues that I could depend on and trust because I knew they were trained and I knew they were trustworthy. In this situation, I was by myself, and everybody I'd met, the people that present themselves, that can help under the nose of the official government and police, 
Who are those type of people that come out to help? I was taking meetings with gun runners, drug smugglers, uh, all these type of people who said that they could claim to help. And who can you trust when you talk to these folk? Even private security contractors who are essentially mercenaries or killers for hire. Can you trust them really with your life in, in, in their hands? That was probably the biggest challenge, I would say, out of all of this. About a week went by and we had met several nefarious characters who were uh, quite corrupt and trying to exploit uh, the situation. Uh, everybody's got their hand in the pockets of this type of business. The Abu Sayyaf take, take hostages for two reasons. One is they need to finance their terrorist activity, right? So they're ransoming out people. Currently, right now, there's, I believe, 16 hostages still down in the Philippines. One's been down there for five years. Several Europeans have been down there for three. They're quite, down there quite a long time. They haven't been able to extract ransoms for those folk, but why do they keep them around? It's because they use them as human shields for the war that's going on down there, okay? Because the Philippine military is very concerned for collateral damage of innocent civilians. So they know that if there's a foreign uh, hostage inside the camp, then they're less, uh, less inclined to attack that base. So that's why, that's the two reasons for people to be down there. After a week uh, of being down there and running into roadblock after roadblock and talking to worse and worse characters in the, in the very, very dangerous areas inside Manila and the slums, a man kind of emerged through my network at West Point. Um, I'm a 2001 graduate of West Point. This man was a 1993 graduate. His name is Dennis Eklerin. He was a lieutenant colonel in the Philippine Scout Rangers. He pretty much emerged almost out of nowhere out of one of my contacts of a former West Point professor and told me that he'd been following this for the last week. It was a quite a big story in the Philippines as well. And he told me that he would help me. And why? Because we were West Pointers. He told me that many, many times during our time. This is a West Point to West, West Pointer to West Pointer thing. This is why I'm helping you. Dennis assembled a team of Filipino operatives, about 15 folk. They started moving in and we started conducting uh, negotiations directly with the, uh, the hostage takers. Um, I can't get into too many of the details on the actual recovery because we ended up signing a lot of NDAs because of an unknown and un, an unspecified government support. Um, but essentially, uh, I'll tell you one story. Uh, during, the, uh, during the actual negotiations, while we were talking about the ransom, which was started at 5 million US, um, there was at one point that I was worried that Evelyn was undergoing Stockholm Syndrome. For those who don't know, Stockholm Syndrome is this, this ca famous case in, uh, in Stockholm, Sweden, where uh, the, hostage t the hostages uh, during a bank robbery actually started siding with the hostage takers. And then when the actual police came in and rescued them, they fought they fought against the police because they sympathized so much with the, uh, with the, uh, the bad guys. So this, this is actually a very common uh, syndrome because of the stress uh, of your life being on the line that people tend to try to rationalize the good in human beings and then side with, with the takers. And so I started seeing that in the, in the conversations that we were having uh, during proof of life conversations with Evelyn was that she started, it started feeling like she was siding with, the, uh, with Abu Sayyaf and she was screaming hysterically on the phone with uh, her family members back in Taiwan and telling them, just sell everything we've got, do anything you can to get me out of here, um, while they, uh, in any case, just incited quite a bit of emotional reaction. So at a certain point, I got on the phone and uh, pretended to be a Taiwanese physician and spoke in Chinese the entire time and told her who I was. I didn't tell her my name, but I told her that I've got, I had several years of, I was a counter-terrorist uh, American commander. I had several years of experience in this and I was doing everything I could, 24 hours, days, seven days a week to try to get her out. And we needed her to remember, do not forget who the enemy is. I told her this three times. Do not forget who the enemy is. At the time, Evelyn later told me that that was a watershed moment for her. Because it switched in her mind knowing that it wasn't just her older brother and older sister Angela trying to help her to get out. But there was somebody behind the scenes that was actually working and that was professional and could get her out. And she changed her mindset and her morale at that, at that time. Unfortunately for me at that moment, at that time, the captors, while I was speaking in Chinese, the entire time were screaming at her to tell, her speak in, to tell me to speak in English over and over. By the time I finished tell, telling her the last, time, the last time not to forget who the enemy was, the captors got on the phone, said to me in English, you're a Taiwanese spy, we're cutting her head off, and they hung up on me. I couldn't, I couldn't get a hold of her, or we couldn't open up another line of communication for three days. I was pulling my hair out. I thought that I had completely overstepped. I thought that I made a mistake. I thought that I had killed her, essentially. Uh, fortunately, Dennis was able to open up a second secret line of communication and negotiations commenced again. Like I said, unfortunately, I can't go into details of the actual recovery operation. But I can tell you that out of three of the Filipino operatives that, we, that went in, uh, I was able to petition for them for medals of valor from the Republic of China and Taiwan. It's the first time 
that Medals of Valor have ever been awarded to foreigners from Taiwan, and it was specifically for heroism and actions on the objective. Um, Another key moment of this is besides, it, there was, so essentially there were two teams, one uh, of the private security contractors or mercenaries that we had hired, and then here with Dennis's team. Right before we went in, Dennis actually went up the chain of command and asked for approval to go in. And said, hey look, we've been working on this for the last few weeks, this is where it's at, we're ready to do this. And all the way up the chain of command, he was actually told to stand down. And I remember when we were in that safe house down in Mindanao, Dennis turned around and looked at his team and said, look, we've been ordered to stand down. I'm still going in, who's going with me? And every single one of those men raised their hands and volunteered, put their lives on the line for Evelyn. A stranger who they never ever met, and for me, a person that they had never met. On the way out, uh, we had to stop by a marine base on, uh, on Holo. The team had to stop by. Uh, they were very shocked to see the famous Taiwanese hostages come in, and for reasons unknown even today, uh, the Marine Colonel, the Filipino Marine Colonel turned around and immediately called the media and said, we've rescued her. Okay and took credit for it. Dennis told me many times during this operation, nobody wanted to step up to help. And he said, success has many mothers and fathers, but failure has none. And that's a really last, long lasting lesson for me out of, this, out, of this, uh, out of this mission. And I saw it immediately afterwards of all different folks, Taiwanese politicians, Malaysians, Filipino police, military, all trying to claim credit for this operation. It's an amazing experience actually just to watch that in its aftermath. Uh, as we, uh, we had to move out of the Philippines, um, as soon as the media uh, found out about the operation, uh, Dennis said through his, uh, his network that not only were the Filipino police coming to interdict us to take Evelyn off our hands, but also, uh, the Mal but also uh, Malaysians, uh, a lot of different groups were interested to come in and grab her in order to claim credit. At this point, after everything we had been through, there's no way I was letting Evelyn out of, my, out of even arm's, arm's length and we were armed to the teeth. There's no way that anybody coming over to come take her off her hands is going to be anything but a fight. So, obviously, we're not looking for a fight, so we try to get out of there and escape. So what the team did at the, uh, the Marine base on Holo was they told them, told the Marine colonel that we were getting on, or that the team was getting on a helicopter the next morning, it would be at a helipad in Zamboanga at about noon. Instead, what they did was they secreted out of the back gate, got on a ferry, rode it for about eight hours, and arrived in Zamboanga at about 6 a.m. From there, we got on a flight. We just, I don't know, Dennis somehow got us on a flight. We just literally drove out on the flight line and then got on the back of the plane um, and flew back to Manila, was intercepted by, um, intercepted by some Taiwanese uh, representatives, uh, got on a China Airlines flight, and when I was taxiing on the runway, Dennis texted me and said, hey, I'm on the, uh, the helipad right now in Zamboanga. The media's down here, the Filipino police is down here. Ha, 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 they're all looking for you. <laughs> and while we took off, and practically, literally giving the finger uh, on, on the way out back to Taiwan. Uh, where when we hit the ground, then the media was all over, all over the place. I was, at the time, stressed out of my mind and wanted to just... Uh, actually, I immediately bought a ticket to Bali uh, and then went down there to hang out for a little while. Um, but that's why the story has come out so much uh, in the media since. Uh, it was largely because of that Marine colonel who, who released the story. Otherwise, I think this could have been all done very quietly. So I tell you this story today, um, mostly because now it's been about a year and I've had some time to process and think about uh, what I've learned from this experience, right? So the first thing I, I touched upon a little bit, and something that I saw in my own experiences in, in combat, was that war, yes, war is probably one of the ugliest things that we have uh, in, in the world today in terms of mankind. It is. There's a lot of destruction. There's a lot of, there's a lot of violence, all those things. But it's funny that in this ugliness and in this darkness, a lot of times this is where we see mankind's greatest attributes of sacrifice, brotherhood, integrity, honor. These type of things can't exist without that environment. I'm not promoting war or promoting the battlefield, but this is interesting for me when I look at this situation, is that for me, in terms of the motivation of, of stepping forward and doing this, was largely, uh, well, I'll return to that in a second, but was largely in the sense of just feeling a responsibility as though fate had brought me to this point where I had these experiences as being a counter-terrorist uh, counter-terrorist commander in, in Iraq, had the experience of fighting the Abu Saf over a period of uh, nearly a couple of years, and it was just very happenstance and coincidental, and I couldn't walk away. It seemed like fate had brought me to that, and everything that I learned in my experiences prepared me for that moment to do this, to do this thing. But it went down there, and then all these actors that had come forward, in spite of all this darkness and the light of it, 
of putting forward their self-sacrifice and putting their lives on the line, their careers on the line. That was something that was a very lasting thing that took, I took away. The second thing that I realized too is that in this experience, one of the reasons why I was able to do this is not because so much of the training. Yes, there were skills, knowledge, and ability as a Green Beret that I understood that I could apply in this situation. But really what it was was that I knew that from all the experiences of, I had in the military as an entrepreneur, as a writer, uh, even in finance here uh, in Hong Kong, was that I had the habit of facing failure and then recouping off of it. I had the habit of facing failure and iterating solutions off of it and knowing they could fix it. This mission, was, even though it was a success at the end, was rife with failure all the way, every single step of the way. But I knew that my personality and the habit that I had formed from challenging myself across many different forms was the key actually to giving me the confidence of doing this operation. Real confidence is not about knowing that you can succeed, it's about knowing that you're going to fail and knowing that you know how to operate and handle the iteration after that. Knowing how to handle yourself in the space after failure is what gives you confidence. So I would submit to the group, when you talk about learning and continuing in your, your journey of, of education, is to seek out challenges. And the harder the better. The harder the better. Because it's only when it's really hard that it's worth your time. It's only when it's really, really hard that the juice is worth the squeeze. And that's, I think, what is worthwhile to find your time in finding those difficult challenges. Thanks.